Okay, we are going to talk today about finding maximum and minimum values for functions of two variables. So, let's start with a refresher of how you would do this in one variable. So let's take this function here. f of x is x minus 1 over x squared. Unless we want to find any local extrema. What does that mean? Well, we have a function f of x equals x minus 1 over x squared. I would rewrite this first as x over x squared minus 1 over x squared or x to the minus 1 minus x to the minus 2. Now you don't have to do this way. You could do this original version using the quotient rule, but I think this way is better. So if that's f, the rule going back to Pierre de Fermat, who's one of the, probably the first person to really come up with this method, is to take the derivative and set it equal to 0. So let's do the derivative of this. Negative x to the minus 2 plus 2x to the minus 3 needs to equal 0. So then we solve this equation. We say, okay, this is the same as saying, well, let's, um, let's see, what do we do here? We would have negative 1 over x squared plus 2 over x to the third, which could be rewritten as 2 minus x over x to the third. <clears throat> now, a function has a max or min, either the derivative is 0 or undefined. So how could a fraction be 0? Well, if the top is 0, 2 minus x equals 0, so x is 2. How could a fraction be undefined? Well, if the bottom is 0, x to the third equals 0, so x is 0. So if there's a min or a max, it would have to be at either 2 or at 0. Let's say there were a couple ways you could do this. There was the sign chart method where you would make a chart here and you would mark all the places here, 0 and 2. And then you'd plug them into this function here and see whether they're positive or negative. So you'd pick a point in each interval. So pick a point over here, like negative 1, and you plug that in, you would get 3 over negative 1, so negative. Plug in, say, positive 1, you'll get a positive number. And plug in 3, you'll get a negative number. Now that tells us, you can look at this and you can maybe intuit that, well, if it's increasing here and starts decreasing, there's probably a maximum at 2. But we can also do the second derivative test. We can say the second derivative here, so take the derivative of the derivative, would be, let's see, it was, this was our first derivative here, so we'll use the power rule again. We get 2x to the minus 3 minus 6x to the minus 4. Now, that 0 is, in fact, not something we really need to worry about. And the reason is because if you look back at the original, 0 is not in the domain. It would give you a 0 denominator. So we can kind of ignore that one. But the 2 we need to take into account, so we're going to plug it into the second root. F double prime of 2 is 2 over 2 to the 3rd minus 6 over 2 to the 4th. And you work that out, that's um, 2 over 8 minus 3 over 8. Because 2 to the 4th is 16, 6 over 16 is 3 over 8. So it's negative 1 eighth. So negative, so what we're saying here is that at 2, f prime is 0, f double prime is less than 0. And that makes it a local maximum. So we could make a graph of this thing. We could say, well, to the left, it's decreasing everywhere. So as you go right, it needs to keep going down. And there's an asymptote at x equal, uh, yeah, x equals 0. But then after this, we have it needs to go up. It needs to hit a max where x is 2, then go back down. 
And if we want to know what exactly it is, we could plug in f of 2 is 2 minus 1 over 2 squared, which would be 1 over 4. So this would go up. It would cross here at 1, hit a peak at 2 comma 1 over 4, and then we have to go down and it would sort of level off like this to infinity. So 2 over 1 fourth is a local max, meaning there is a neighborhood around here where it's the biggest thing. And it's also a global max if you look at this. So f of x is always less than 1 fourth for any x. Now is there also an absolute or global minimum? Well no, because you can see here it goes down to negative infinity. But what if we restrict the domain? If we were to say domain is 1 to 3, well then you would just bracket it here and here and you'd see the minimum here is at 0, is x is 1, y is 0. So this is a rule you learned back in Calc 1, and I'm going to, but I'm going to refresh it what it means anyway, which means that it says that a, um, a continuous function on a compact set. Now, you probably didn't use that word, but what it really means is just it's both closed and bounded. So, yeah, there's a max and has an absolute max and min. So that 1, 3, that is compact because it's closed since it has the endpoints. And it's bounded because it never gets bigger than 3 or lower than 1. So what we are saying here then is that if it is not, if your domain is not like this, one of these closed sets, closed and bounded sets, there might not be any maxes or mins. That's the main takeaway there. All right, so let's... Um, go through what our definitions are. So what is the difference between local and global extrema in two dimensions? Here is the one dimensional version there. Here is this person at the top of the highest mountain in New Mexico. He's at the local max for New Mexico. But over here this person is at the top of the highest mountain in Colorado. That's another local max. Now up here, this guy in Tibet is higher than both of them, and yet, because you can see the ground dips a little, that's actually a local minimum. So, here's our definition. We've got a point x naught, y naught. It is a local or relative maximum, they mean the same thing, for a function f. If you can draw some ball around the point <coughs> d, being the set of all x, y, where the distance is less than r. And that the f at that center, f of x naught y naught, is greater than or equal to the function at all other points. Let's, uh, let's do that visually, because those it's a lot of symbols. What we're just saying is this. We've got a function with two-dimensional output. We've got some point x naught y naught. Can you draw a ball around it where f is higher there than it is at every point around it? And so this is like the peak of one of our 3D terrains where it is the highest point for everything on some ball around it, some neighborhood, even if there are other points farther away that are higher doesn't have to be a big neighborhood, it just has to be some ball you can draw around it. Minimum is the same, you just flip the last sign there. 
I want to give a note on the vocabulary. If I ask you, or the homework asks you, where is a local max, it means give the input. But if they say, what is the local max, it means give the output. So if I say, what is a maximum, means, or what is the maximum, means how high does it get. If I say, where is it, it means what do I need to plug in to, to get that. All right. So how are we actually going to find these now that we've got our definition? Well, if we have an open domain, and that's what we're focused on today, so the boundary is not included, it might not have a max or min. Because if it were on the boundary, but you cut the boundary out, you can't get it. So here is a test, though. Just like we said, you test for single variable to find max and min by taking derivatives set to zero. Well, here you're going to take both of the partial derivatives. If it's a max or min, then both partial derivatives there will be zero. Now, that doesn't mean that it's automatically a max or min if they're both zero, but it, you, that's how you your first test to narrow it down. That gives your candidates. So, a critical point, just any point where either they're both zero, both partial derivatives are zero, or at least one of them does not exist. So, that's you're going to be your test. You're going to take both partial derivatives and you're going to check where are they zero and where, if anywhere, do they not exist. The not exist comes up with something like a cone. So if we had a shape like in 3D, something like you know this at a sharp cusp here the derivative wouldn't exist. So that would make it a max. So that's why we have to check that just in case. But most of our functions will be smooth, meaning the derivatives will exist. So let's start with something like this. 2x squared plus y squared plus 8x minus 6y plus 20. Let's see if we can find its critical points. All right, well, we'll start off by taking the partial derivatives. f sub x is 4x plus 8, which we said equal to 0. Okay, x is minus 2. f sub y is 2y minus 6, so y is 3. So negative 2, 3 is the only critical point. So is it a max, is it a min, or is it neither? Well, this is a case where there is a trick we can use. If you look at that original problem, 2x squared, let's rearrange things, plus 8x plus y squared minus 6y plus 20. This is a quadric surface. We could do completing the square on this one. We can so let's let's refresh how to do completing the square again. I will factor out a two from here because it's easier if the squared term is just x squared and doesn't have a coefficient. Plus y squared minus six y plus twenty. So let's see what do we need to add. Well, eight x so half of eight is four squared is add sixteen. And so then we need to subtract, wait, oh, I made a mistake, didn't I? Back up, back up. That 8 should be a 4, shouldn't it? I factor out the 2 from the x squared, but not the 4. So, try that again. Half of 4 is 2, squared is 4, so we add 4. Half of 6, or negative 6 is negative 3, square that, we add 9. Okay, so over here, we added... 4 inside, which means you really added 8. So we'll put a minus 8 here. We added 9 here. So we'll put a minus 9 here. And so we get 2 x minus 2 squared plus y minus 3 squared plus 3. So if you look at this, well, yeah, then... We can see, uh, that should be a plus, sorry. 
So that should be negative 2 and 3 is a minimum. We can tell from this equation because if you put in anything else, one of these will be positive. Or both of them will be positive, but they can't be negative. So 2 negative 3 is a minimum. And if we want to know its actual value, well, if you plug it in, you would just get 3. Okay, so that's an example, but it's a weird example. It's not the kind we usually do. It's not all that useful. So we want to find a more general process, one that, you know, it works even when it's not such a convenient example. Well, let's look at another example here. F of xy is y squared minus x squared. Let's find the local extreme on that one. Well, we'll do the same starting place. fx is 2, negative 2x. fy is 2y. And if we set them both to 0, that means the only solution is 0, 0. Now, if we look at the equation, f of xy is y squared minus x squared. If we're here at the point 0, 0, and we go to the right, we will get negative. Because x is getting larger and has a negative in front of it, where y is not changing. But if we go up, y is getting larger, but x is staying at 0, it will get positive. Meaning, this is going to be neither a max nor a min. In fact, what we're most likely to get... If we go in the x direction, it's a peak. But if we go in the y direction, it's a valley. This is going to be a saddle point. And it would give us the second derivative, f double x would be negative 2, and f double y would be positive 2. And so when... The f double x, f of y have opposite signs. That you should expect to be a saddle point. But that's not the true test because it's possible it could be twisted. And so maybe the double x and double y are both positive. But at some other weird angle, it's negative. So we need a more general test here. And now I'm going to go ahead and give it to you. So this is the second derivative test, and you're going to use this whenever you've got an open domain. So, we'll come up with this new thing called the discriminant, f double x, f double y, minus fxy, fyx. Um, so there is another way to write it, and that is as a determinant, we can say the discriminant is f xx, fxy, fyx, fyy, and it's the two-dimensional determinant of this, so you do this multiple minus this multiple. f double x, f double y, minus fxy, and we have said that usually fxy and fyx are the same, so we can just write it as fxy squared, if you'd rather. It's a little more compact. So here's the test. If the second partials are continuous near some point AB, and AB is a critical point, so we've already found out that they're both zero, or one's undefined. No, they can't be undefined, because they need to be continuous. But if we found that it's continuous and it's a critical point, so they're both zero, then we can use this flow chart. So first we check the discriminant which is this thing. We plug in the point to this. If it's negative, it's a saddle point. If it's zero, the test is inconclusive. We'd have to find some other way. If it's positive, then we need to do one more test, which is we check F double X. You could also use F double Y. It would give you the same thing. But if F double X is positive, then that's a local minimum. If it's negative, it's a local max. The idea basically being that once we found discriminants positive, we know that these 
have to be the same, so it's either a max or a min, depending on whether you get positive or negative for F double X. So this is your big test, and it is the one that you need to memorize, and it is the one that you will be using on exams in order to find local maxes and mints. So let's do an example. Well, let's give it in words here, too. Because this flow chart, some people like diagrams, some people like words. So here's the verbal explanation. First, you find the partial derivatives, the first partials. Then you solve these two equations, fx is 0 and fy is 0, simultaneously. That, so you need a single point or any list of points where each one makes them both 0. Those are called critical points. Then you do the second partials, both the double x, double y, and the x, y, y, x. You plug the critical points that you found in step 2 into D. And if it's negative, you call it a saddle point and you're done. The ones that gave you positive values, you'll plug into F double X or F double Y. And that'll tell you for max and min. And then if you're asked, if you're asked what are the values, you'd actually plug in those points, the original F, to get what those values are. All right, now we're ready to do an example. You say derivative does find any extreme of this function, FXY is negative X cubed plus 4XY minus 2Y squared plus 1. All right. So, step one, find the first partials. Well, fx is negative 3x squared plus 4y. fy is 4x minus 4y. And step two, we need to solve both of these for zero. So we have two equations here. They have 3x squared plus 4y equals zero and 4x minus 4y equals 0. So this second equation looks simpler to solve, so I'm going to go ahead and do that. 4x equals 4y, so x equals y. All right, so I'm going to plug in, I'm going to replace that y with an x. Negative 3x squared plus 4x is 0. So x is times 4 minus 3x equals 0. This means x has to be either 0 or 4 thirds. So what are our critical points? Well, these are points, remember, so they need to be x, y pairs. So the pair, since we said x equals y, would be either 0, 0 or 4 thirds, 4 thirds. Those are your two critical points, meaning Either if those aren't max or mins, then nothing is. Those are the only things that could be. Again, unless there were any points where the derivatives are undefined, but these derivatives are always defined. All right. So step three, let's find the second partials. Okay, well, f double x is negative 6x, f xy is 4, fyx is also 4, and again, these should pretty much always be the same. If they weren't the same, it would mean they weren't continuous, and then this second derivative test wouldn't work anyway, because that was in the hypothesis. f double y is negative 4. So now, step 4 says... We need to work out what the discriminant is. So, well, the discriminant is going to be negative 6x, 4, this, is a, this looks like a y, but it's a 4, 4 and negative 4, which would be 24x minus 16. Okay, so we'll check our points here. D of 0, 0, so x is 0 and y is 0. Well, there is no y, but that's fine. So we get 24 times 0 minus 16 is negative 16, which is negative. <clears throat> so since it's negative, our flow chart says that makes it a saddle point. Uh, excuse me. If you'll remember what it said here. 
we are at this stage here. We are on the negative side, so it's a saddle point. Now let's check the other one, the four-thirds. D of four-thirds, four-thirds is 24 times four-thirds minus 16, which would be 32 minus 16 or 16, which is positive. So we're now on the left side of the flow chart. We now know that it's either a max or a min. So step five is plug in this one, since it's not a saddle point, to F double X. F double X is <coughs> negative six X. That was it, right? Yes, negative six X. Negative six times four thirds. X is four thirds. Would be, I mean, all we really care about is it's negative. I don't even, I'm not even gonna bother calculating it. It's less than zero, that's all that matters. So it's a max. So we have saddle point at zero, zero, local max at four thirds, four thirds. And step six, if we're asked, we would plug in four thirds, four thirds to the original. So F of four thirds, four thirds, which would be negative four thirds cubed plus four times four thirds times four thirds minus two times four thirds is there something else? Plus, what was the last bit? Plus one. And I wouldn't ask you to do this on a test, but if you do this on a calculator, it comes out to, um, what is it, 59, 59 over 27. So, what does this tell me? Well, let's, let's look at a quick graph of this. Negative x to the third plus 4xy minus 2y squared plus 1. All right. So we can see there at that zero, zero, that's a saddle point. It's going the max that way and a minimum this way. But the four thirds, four thirds, you can see there's a local maximum right there. All right, let's keep going. Hmm, this is all mixed up. I'm gonna have to cut a little of this. This is annoying. How do I turn off the full screen thing? The frames or whatever I did. I don't know what button. Oh, no, that didn't. That helped a little. Alright, let's go back to this. Close fourteen seven. Where did it go? Okay, so that was our first solid example. 
that's the most likely type of problem you would see on a test, on an exam, where you can go through the whole process. Now there are a few tricks. Let's do a tricky one. Find a local extreme of f of x, y equals x squared, y squared. How would you do this? Well, let's do the same thing as before. All right, so we have the function f of x, y equals x squared, y squared. Let's do the partials. fx is 2xy squared, and fy is 2x squared y. And we set these both to zero. So let's do the first one. So, if 2xy squared is 0, that means either x is 0 or y is 0. And in fact, that's the same for the other case too, isn't it? So we can see where x or y are 0, those are both critical points, meaning along the entire x and y axes are critical points. And if we try and do the second derivative test, well, we would get f double x is 2y squared, fxy is 4xy, fyx is also 4xy, f double y is uh, 2x squared. So the discriminant, where well, you take the determinant of this 2 by 2 matrix here, and you would get 4x squared y squared minus, mm, did I, mm, 16x squared y squared but then if I plug in any of these where x is 0 or y is 0, it's going to equal 0 at all critical points. And if you'll remember our flowchart, it says if the discriminant is 0, then there's really nothing we can do. Or at least this particular test is useless. So we'll have to be a little more clever. Well, if you think about it, what's happening here along these, since the function was x squared, y squared, the value is 0. Now, x squared, y squared, though, can never be negative. It's always going to be greater than or equal to 0. So that means they're all local minima. Let's look at the graph of this. We did x squared, y squared. So what you got here, you've got this, these little corridors here in the center, and then that goes up everywhere else. So the conclusion to this one, believe it or not, is that every, uh, that was weird, every point on X or Y axes is a local minimum. And it's fine that there's ties. They're allowed to have other points around it that are the same height as long as there's nothing larger. Okay. Got a couple more I want to do. So let's see what's next. Find the shortest distance from the point 1, 0, negative 2 to the plane. Uh, x plus 2y plus z equals 4. Well, we need to write an equation to express the distance. So, if we have a plane out here in space, something like this. 
then there is some point on it. Oh, no, sorry, we've got the fixed point 1, 0, negative 2 down here somewhere. The shortest distance would be at a right angle, and there's like sort of a projection thing. But that's not how I want to do this. I want to write an equation expressing the distance. So call the target point just x, y, z. We don't know what it is, so we just call it x, y, z. So what is the distance from x, y, z to 1, 0, negative 2? Well, it would be the square root of x minus 1 squared plus y minus 0 squared plus z plus 2 squared. Now I'm going to do a common cheat, which I discussed the other day, I think, which is to, instead of doing the, the distance, we'll just do the distance squared. x minus 1 squared plus y squared plus z plus 2 squared. And this is allowed because any point where the distance at a minimum would also be a point where the distance squared is at a minimum. So we're going to, we got three variables here and I don't like that. So let's use the equation we were given. x plus 2y plus z equals 4. This is called a constraint because if we were allowed to pick any point at all, we would just pick the point itself, 1, 0, negative 2. That's the closest point to it. But we need to pick a point on this plane. So we will use this, plug it in to get rid of one of the variables. And that's where it represents applying this constraint. So let's get rid of z. Let's say z equals negative x minus 2y plus 4. And then we will plug it in over here. So f of x, y gives us x minus 1 squared plus y squared plus z plus 2 squared. What am I talking about? Z. We're trying to get rid of the Z. So let's go ahead and get rid of it. So instead of Z, we'll write negative X minus 2Y plus 4 plus 2 squared. All right. Now you could do this right now using the chain rule, or you can expand and collect like terms, and I'll just do that and skip to the end. You get 2x squared plus 5y squared minus 14x minus 24y plus 4xy plus 36. This is a 3 by 3 squared, so it takes a little work. I recommend making a little table here. Negative x, negative 2y, and 4 plus 2 is 6. And the same thing on our side, negative x, negative 2y, and 6. Just fill in all the little boxes and add them up. And you'll get this part, or part of this, and expand this, and collect all the like terms. Anyway, this is what I get. So we can go ahead. We're trying to minimize this thing. And so now we go ahead and do that. We started with three variables that didn't make sense, but by using the plane equation, we were able to eliminate one of them. So fx is 4x minus 14 plus 4y. And fy is 10y minus 24 plus 4x. Now we need to set these both to zero. And then we rearrange so we get 4x plus 4y equals 14. Now 4x plus 10y equals 24. 
Yes. Now this is a two system, two unknown problem. So we can solve this. I'll multiply this by, or I'll, sub, I'll just subtract. We get four minus 10 is negative six. Y equals 14 minus 24 is negative 10. So y is 5 over 3. Then you plug back in. We said 4x plus 4y equals 14. So 4x plus 4 times 5 over 3 equals 14. Solve that x is 11 over 6. So our critical point is 11 over 6 and 5 over 3. <clears throat> now, just by sort of a common sense argument, there's no way this could be a maximum. Well, if you think about it, we were talking about a plane and a point. This point can't be the maximum distance. I don't think it could be a saddle point either. I think the minimum has to exist so this is it. I guess, but we can check just to be sure. F double X is just four. Because what was FX? FX was four X minus 14 plus four Y. It was just four. And FY would just be 10. F double Y would be 10. FXY and FYX are also 4. So the discriminant here would be 4, 4, 4, 10, which is 40 minus 16 is 24, which is positive. So it's not a saddle point. And F double X is positive, so it would have to be a minimum. So the point was where X is 11 over 6 and Y is 5 over 3. Now we're supposed to get a 3D point, so we have, what was it? Z equals negative X minus 2Y plus 4. So if we plug those in, we'll get Z is... negative seven over six. And if you want the actual distance, because you just said, what is the closest point? But if you want to know how close is it in fact, you would have to do this. You would have to use the version with the square root because the actual distance, you know, it has a square root in it. And it ends up being five root six over six. All right, let's do one last example. One of these problems in calculus world where people are always making boxes with lids missing. So, a rectangular box without lid is made from 12 mirror squared of cardboard. Find the maximum possible volume. So let's see how this would work. Our last problem will be this question about a rectangular box without a lid. It's made from 12 meters squared of cardboard and we're saying find the maximum possible volume. So, let's try this out. So, whenever we're doing optimization, we have one thing we're trying to optimize, that's the volume. This is called the objective function. And we have something else that we are not allowed to change. In this case, it is, the name for it is the constraint. And if you think about a box, the dimensions here, oh, this box looks ugly, but that's it's X, Y, and Z. On the bottom will be just an X, Y, but the sides will be two X, Y, 2xz and 2yz. Now the point of the constraint is that without it the problem's too easy. You could just put in, you find a box with infinite volume and that doesn't make sense. 
So we need to use this surface area here, this constraint, to eliminate one of the variables from v. So we'll say solve for z. This thing needs to be equal to 12. That's what we were given. So we'll say 12 minus xy equals 2xz plus 2yz. Let's solve for z here. So this becomes z 2x plus 2y. So then z equals 12 minus xy over 2x plus 2y. So now we plug that back into the volume. So volume is xyz. So it's 12xy minus x squared y squared over 2x plus 2y. All right, so we need to get the partial derivatives of this function. Bx is near the top times, times the bottom minus near the bottom times the top all over the bottom squared. Now you work this out, it becomes, there's a lot of algebra you need to do for this, but it works out to v squared 12 minus x squared minus 2xy over 2x plus y squared. And then if you do the same thing for Vy, you would get eventually x squared 12 minus 2xy minus y squared over 2x plus y squared. So, we need to solve these. Let's look at this one, for instance. X equals negative Y doesn't make sense because we're talking about volume, we're talking about physical objects, so they must both be positive. Let's look at the numerator. If X squared 12 minus 2XY minus Y squared is zero, well, if x equals 0, then volume is 0. That's a minimum, because if you have no length or no width, then the volume will be 0. So the more practical case is 12 minus 2xy minus y squared is 0. And the other, example, the other piece from the x is we'd set this part equal to 0, so we'd have... negative 12 plus x squared plus 2xy equals 0. I just flipped a negative there so that I would be able to cancel out the 2xy's. So we add these together, we would get x squared minus y squared is 0. So x equals, x squared equals y squared. And that means that x is plus or minus y. But again, since we're talking about physical objects, the minus doesn't make any sense. So just x equals y. So now we should be able to solve this. We look at our constraint, the SA. And we can replace the y's with x's. 12 minus 2x squared minus x squared is 0. So 12 equals x no, equals 3x squared. x squared equals 4, so x is 2. So x is 2, y is 2, 
And if you go back to the constraint, the surface area, Z will be 1. And the volume of 2, 2, 1 equals 4. Sorry, this, this part here wasn't the surface area. That was just um, plugging into one of these two equations, replacing the x with the y. My mistake. Yeah, this is just using this to solve. Once we know that x equals y, we just change one of them to just being just x and solve it. And so the volume, so the maximum is to say that the length and the width are both 2, and the height is 1. Now, technically, we need to do the second partials test, but, I mean, I mean, look at these things. Does anyone really want to do a second derivative on one of these? I don't. And given our natural constraint that we had, we were talking about a physical object, it seems obvious that it must be a maximum. I don't think we could have gotten a minimum volume with this. I mean, we know it's not. The volume is 4. And we already found the min volume would be 0. So we can go ahead and say this is the max. So if you can make a compelling argument in one of these word problems as to why it's obviously a max or min, why it can't be the other, then you don't have to do the whole second partials thing. All right. Thank you.